Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nancy Grace, host of the new Oxygen original series, Injustice with Nancy Grace, and founder of CrimeOnline.com. I am so happy to be here. Hello, CrimeCon. Thank you for being with us tonight. Woo! I am so happy also because that is the first time I have shown a clip of our brand new program, Injustice. And can I tell you why I wanted to show it here tonight? Because you were the ones with me way back when. You were with me when I first started off at Court TV and Larry King. Remember those days? And you were with me when I announced I was having twins. <laughs> and when Lucy and I almost died in childbirth, you were there. In fact, I still have all the baby booties, all the picture frames, all the blankets that you made. And one day, I'm going to reopen those boxes. I'm going to show them all to the twins. And I want to thank you. It was so important to me that you got to see that first because it is our next chapter. And I'm so proud. That was the first of a series that starts July 13 at my new TV home, Oxygen. And we have work and work and work to bring it to you guys. You know, I handpicked that particular case for a reason. Because in that case, that young husband, that father, he, yes, he kisses his wife and the baby goodbye that morning, and he leaves. And it reminds me so much of my fiancé, Keith. And I'll tell you why. Because that morning, my parents, I was at my parents' house in Macon and got up at like five in the morning. Left. Guys, am I fixed? Oh, okay. Does that work? Is it really working? Okay. Okay. I'm not going to pretend that that's never happened before, but my husband's here. Just know that, deep inside. That morning, I remember Keith left. He kissed me bye-bye, and he drove away, and he swung his arm up on the other side of the car and waved goodbye. I never saw him alive again. And when I first saw that story, when I first heard about that case, it made me think about that morning. And I can remember right now, there's an old saying in middle Georgia, don't watch somebody out of sight because it's bad luck. And I remember as he went out around the curve, I turned away. You know, that case I just showed you, it was determined the official COD cause of death was that he somehow went under the dark waters of Lake Seminole and that those waters claimed his life along with the gators that lived there. One person never gave up. One person kept fighting. One person stayed strong to the finish, to the end. And that person was his mother. Now, you know, I did not know this when I first started prosecuting. And I thought I knew it all because I had been, I'm a crime victim of violent crime. But now I know. And you can't tell anybody this. That there is nothing stronger than a mother's love. Not on this earth anyway. And that is who, that's right. That is who stand, stood by and helped us unravel the mystery surrounding his death. Because she had that love. You know, that love that makes you brave, that makes you do things you would never do all on your own. That love that gives you strength that you wouldn't have 
without it. She was there. She was the soldier that stayed till the end. We invest, investigate another case of a little girl, a teen girl, who went missing. Her body was found in Lake Jordan near a bridge, Annie. When her dad went to go identify her body, the only thing left he could identify was the dimple on her chin. Her face was so disfigured by the beating this little girl had sustained. It was nothing but mush. And he saw that dimple, and he broke down in tears because he knew that was Annie. The case went cold. It went dead. Who fought till the end? Who stayed strong to the finish? Who didn't quit? The woman that was her caseworker that loved her so much she adopted her and a rookie female cop. They never gave up. They stayed on it. Another case we look at at Oxygen is when, I don't know if you remember this or not, but one of my very closest friends became a suspect in the murder of his own wife. And let me tell you something, I went to the crime scene, I looked, I questioned people, and that case put me in such a moral dilemma about what I knew and what I thought I knew and what the evidence was telling me. It put me and him to the test in very different ways. You know, looking out at you tonight and knowing that many of you, like me, believe in justice and what justice can be, what it should be. My thought tonight is staying strong to the finish, strong to the end, because everyone will come up on that moment that you look back and you realize that was the moment that defined you. That is the moment that made you who you are. And if you fail, you'll remember it the rest of your life. You'll think back on it and wonder, why didn't I do something? When you hear that voice that says, do something, do anything, just do something. And you know what? It may be when you see somebody slap a child in the face at the grocery store. It might be when you're in the parking lot at the Walmart and you see a baby locked in a car crying alone. It might be when you see a coworker pull her sleeve down over bruises. The call to act and to not give up when the going gets rough. You know, you ever heard anybody say, I don't want to get involved. Well, you know what? If you know about the injustice, you've heard about it, you've seen it, you're already involved. It's too late. I'm too busy. I'll do it later. There may not be a later. This isn't the right place. This isn't the time or place to make a scene. Well, let me tell you, any time is the right time to do the right thing. You know... In the last weeks, we have been, we have joined the search for a little four-year-old girl. You may know her name because I've got it branded in my mind, Malia Davis. This little girl goes missing while her mom is out of town. You know what I found out the more I investigated? Malia, four years old had just gotten out of the hospital shortly before. You know why? A head injury. She had a fracture to her skull that was so severe. The doctors had to remove part of her skull to let the swelling and the bleeding in her brain diffuse. And you know when they do that, they take that piece of skull and they put it in a freezer or they put it in the child's abdomen to keep it alive. 
And then finally, when all the swelling goes down, they put, they put the skull back together again. And guess how that happened? How the child got a skull fracture so severe, she had to have a piece of abdomen, put a piece of skull in her stomach from falling from a chair. And as I speak to you tonight, remains have been found off I-30 near Hope, Arkansas. And those remains have been identified as Malia Davis. Nobody stayed strong, and now she is dead. Blood has been found in the home, and human tissue has been found in the home's plumbing. Nobody knew you know, you might think something's wrong. You just can't drop it. You have to see it through, even when the going gets rough. At this hour, the search is still on for a Connecticut mother of five. Her name is Jennifer Dulos. In the last hours, we learned that sponges and clothing covered in Jennifer's blood has been found in no less than 30 trash cans over a four-mile stretch in New Haven, Connecticut. That's one of the most expensive zip codes in this country, just like 90210. And now her blood is in trash receptacles all throughout a four-mile stretch let me tell you a little story that I tell as a tribute to someone that intervened. A little three-year-old baby girl sat at the foot of a big pine tree playing in the mud, red mud. At a distance, she saw a woman approaching her, her face like a mask. The woman got closer and closer, and as she did, she lifted up over her shoulder a hoe like a spear. And she got closer and closer, and the girl, too young to know to cry or run, just sat there. And she reared back, and with one swift plunge, she tore the neck out of a big, fat rattler coiled up behind the little girl. Coiled, you know what that means, about to spring. The woman dropped every down on her knees and got the baby and picked her up. And when the baby was carried away, she looked back and could see the rattler still pinned to the ground with the hoe writhing. That woman was my mother, and that baby was me and I remember seeing that and in that moment when fear had overcome her she went up to a coiled rattler and stabbed it through the neck to save me she didn't quit when the going got rough she didn't give in to fear she kept walking up right using a hoe as a spear now the other side of that story she's now 87 and she lives with me <laughs> and it ain't easy people <laughs> you know when I think about Malia and I think about Jennifer Dulos and I think about Annie, and I think about Pam Vitale, and I think about Mike and that duck hunting incident. I can't let it go. You know, I went on from those hot but idyllic days in middle Georgia. I went off to school to major in Shakespeare and literature. Yes, I did. I know. It doesn't seem real, does it? And I hadn't been there long, and I was walking across campus, 
And I looked over and I saw Keith Griffin and I went. And I immediately thought, oh, he's too handsome. He would never date somebody like me, ever. It took me about one month to break him and his girlfriend up and to move in, okay? So we got engaged and planned our wedding. And uh, I remember one morning I was taking one of my last exams. It was statistics. It's burned in my memory. And I tried so hard, and I came out, and it was dark in the building, and what strikes me is it was so bright and shiny and a happy summer day in August and I headed to my job at the library at Mercy University. And I called en route and said, I'm running late. I was in an exam. I'm hurrying because I was on foot. And, of course, I had to stop at a pay phone because we didn't have cell phones. And they said, call Keith's sister. And I knew right then that Keith was dead. And I remember trying to dial the numbers, and it was like a moth in a flame to a light, just batting around. And I said, is Keith gone? And she said, yes. And I did not even know what had happened. All I could think was, if I can just get there, if I can just get there. And I stopped on the way home. Nobody was home, and I went into our church, and out of the blue, our pastor was there, and I said, this horrible thing has happened. I've got to find, if I could just get to him, we can fix it. Maybe, maybe he's at the hospital. And I was looking across the desk, and I saw him right upside down, Bernstein Funeral Home. And then I knew it didn't matter if I got to him, and I couldn't fix it. And I said, what happened? Was he in a car crash? I was just with him this morning. And he said, Nancy, Keith was murdered. And that's what happened. He had left a construction site where he was working to go get everyone soft drinks at lunch. And when he came back in in the company truck, there was a guy there that had been fired a few weeks before. And he saw the company truck and he just opened up gunfire. And he shot Keith five times in the face, in the neck, in the head. And what I remember is I would say, Keith, your eyes are so blue, I think I could swim in them. And I thought right then it was all over, and it felt like it was over. And I dropped out of school, and I couldn't eat, and I couldn't stand to hear the clock on the wall. And then one day... I looked and it felt like the world had quit spinning and I got off and the world had kept spinning and I couldn't believe that everything was carrying on as normal. The way I grew up, we didn't know about crime. I could ride my bike all day after work and come home when I heard the church bells ringing, God will take care of you and his eye is on the sparrow. I didn't know anything about crime or hatred. I went back to school finally to get into law school and it took me a minute but I finally became one of the first female special prosecutors in what was then the murder capital of the country, <laughs> inner city Atlanta. <laughs> After Keith's murder, the life I had planned was over. I knew I would never be a wife or a mother. And I tried every way I could to sabotage any chance of happiness that came my way. I only cared about one thing, putting a bad guy in jail. And I would do anything 
within the law <laughs> to do that. And I did not care how bad my reputation was, what they said in the newspaper. It did not matter to me, and I did not and do not care. I remember a three-year-old girl with her head covered in pigtails with barrettes. A hundred. A hundred barrettes. And her sister, a hundred barrettes. Both of them had been raped repeatedly. And when I prosecuted that case, I got held in contempt. And let me tell you something. Every public defender in the courthouse came running to the courtroom to see me get fingerprinted. <laughs> but I can tell you who had the last laugh because he got a lot more jail time than I did. 25 years is what he got, praise God. <laughs> I want to tell you about a case, uh, two of them I have never have never publicly talked about. One is about a 13-year-old little girl who went missing. She was raped and beaten horribly. Had just, just turned 13. Do you know how old my children are? They're 11. They're about to turn 12. They are my world. I hope my husband's not listening because he thinks he's my world. <laughs> this child was only a year and a half older than them. And then she seemingly disappeared into the streets of Atlanta and nobody could find her. Now today they call that sex trafficking because this child was forced to turn tricks out on the street in one motel after the next, after the next, after the next, after the next and on and on and on. Let me tell you, I looked and looked and looked for that girl. Because how could I prove a case without her? We would be out on the street and it was so cold, even in Atlanta. And I would come in off the street, my hair would be everywhere. And I remember because one day they took the uh, district attorney ID pictures. And I had just come in off the street and I was just looking at the camera. I looked like a felon. <laughs> and... I remember coming in and the courthouse had those radiators down the side of the wall and I would go stand by it from coming in and still wearing my little coat. And I would look out there and wonder, where is that girl? Does she have on a coat? I guess my mind wouldn't let me think about what she was really living through. You know, the nitty gritty of what she was living through. Well, we found her. Or we thought we did. I got a tip. We got some intel. She was at a flop house off Stewart Avenue, a motel. Got with my three vice cops. We went out there. I had her school picture from the sixth grade in my hand. I went in the room and said, she's in there. I went in and I looked at all the women in there. I'm like, <clears throat> I went out, I'm like, I'm supposed to be at the grand jury today. She's not in there. And I was very angry. And they went, go back. They were my ride, so I did what they told me. I went back in, I looked. She looked like a 38-year-old woman. She had a weave down her back. She had a skirt up to here, boots up to here. Makeup. Like, I, I could, and I looked in my hand, and I looked at her. Well, let me tell you something. We went to trial. I got her, and we out, up out of there, and got that weave out of her head, and we went to trial. Well, okay, I got a mistrial. In opening statements, my opening statement, because I turned to them, I said to the jury, I will prove to you. They are nothing but pimps. Whoa, you'd have thought the, the earth had ended. I got a mistrial because they had not been charged with misdemeanor pimp. They had only been charged with aggravated rape and sodomy, statutory rape. I'm like, so I hurt their reputation by calling them a pimp. 
Let me tell you, I went, fine. Which, man, you know, when your wife says, fine, it's anything but fine. I went back to the grand jury. I got him re-indicted to include a misdemeanor pimp charge. Struck another jury the very next day. Don't clap yet. Because the next morning, it was time for her testimony. She disappeared. I was about to jump in my skin. I acted like nothing was wrong. I kept trying the case and trying the case. The minute 5 o'clock hit, we left, and we hit the... It was on the 6 o'clock news, the 11 o'clock news, trying to find this girl. She was afraid to testify, afraid they'd get her back. Because she assumed they would get off and be free. We got her back at about 5 a.m. I went back into court and tried the case, and I'm happy to report they both got life. I want to tell you about the case last that nearly made me quit the practice of law. By this time, I was a special prosecutor, and I would call, was called in on certain cases. This would be my first mass murder. From what I understand, this went down at about 11 p.m. on a Sunday night, in an apartment complex in Atlanta. Three dead bodies that we know of, and they were all little boys on a playground. As you know, the drug battle is a battle between good and evil. The devil wants you to try drugs, and nothing makes him happier than when you are addicted because your life is pure hell and he feeds off that. Miami, major port for drugs, crack, heroin, cocaine, everything. Straight up 75, first pit stop Atlanta. The homicide rate was skyrocketing. My boss wanted me to try this case because these three were caught in the middle of a drug turf battle and to this day I remember going to the crime scene blood was literally running down the gutter because one of the boys had run and was shot as he was trying to jump over a chain link fence with a gutter underneath it I tried that. I tried and tried. Nobody would testify. Nobody would come forward. The, the apartment complex was in the shape of a U. And I remember at night, going in the dark of night, knocking on doors, asking people to please testify. Tell me what they saw. They'd slam the door. One pulled a gun on me. Nobody wanted to testify. I'd go in crack houses. You name it. I found out there was one witness. And this is what nearly broke me. It was a female. She drove a school bus. So I was crouched in my Honda, hiding, waiting for her to finish driving her school bus and come home. Because I had my eyes trained on her door. And I knew what she looked like. And a school bus came in. Not her, but a school bus. And all the children came running off that school bus onto a playground where the murders took place. And I had been over that playground with a fine-tooth comb looking for evidence. And that playground was covered in broken glass, syringes, glassine bags that contained cocaine and crack, gunshot casings, bullets, on the playground. And those little children came running off the bus and ran up on that playground. And I was watching them. And they were so happy. And they were on the swing, swinging over that broken glass and all those syringes. And, all. and it just took me over. 
that a whole new generation of little children were getting raised up on that. They would never have a chance. And I put my head down on my steering wheel and I cried and I cried and cried. Because I couldn't fight it. I couldn't stop it. Even if I got this conviction, it wouldn't matter. What about them? You cannot walk through the mud every day, even if you're wearing hip boots, and not track it home. And I was so overwhelmed. I couldn't go on. And I was thinking that night when I got home and I was all alone, why am I here? How did I get here? I'm supposed to be living in Colorado with Keith. By now I would have cooked supper. I would have put my imaginary children to bed. And I'd be getting ready to go teach Shakespearean literature tomorrow. Why am I here? Why am I out wandering through a playground covered in glass and syringes? But I tried that case, and I guarantee you it had to be the Lord because I wanted to quit so bad. I was just saturated with crime and bad things, and I did not feel like I had the strength to go back to court. But I did, and this is what I argued to the jury, that some people are too weak, too poor, too illiterate, too afraid to speak and that they, you, me, us, must be their voice. That you must do all the good you can, wherever you can, as hard as you can, as long as you can. And as I said that, I heard it ringing in my own ears. Who will not only hear the call, but stay strong to the end. Because let me tell you something. You're not going to be judged by the bank account you amass, by your resume or all the letters at the end of your name. You are going to be judged by the fight you fought and whether you finished the fight. Because it will get hard, and you will get weary, and you will want to quit. The fight to the finish. Because when I go to heaven, God help me. I don't want to show up perfect, pristine, clean, hermetically sealed. I want to slide in. And stand up and say, I got nothing. I used it all. I want to be bruised. I want to be cut. I want to be bleeding. I want my hair and my face looking bad. I want to be exhausted with bags under my eyes. I want tire tracks on me. And I want to say, I used it all. All my blood. All my sweat. All my tears. And I want to tell you, Lord, that when I would put my boots on the ground in the morning, the devil would say, oh, no, she's up. (laughs) So it's easy to talk a big talk. But the trick is to walk the big walk. Stay strong to the end. Thank you. Okay, questions, and let me just say, O.J. did it. Just get that out of the way. And taught mom is a tramp. Get that out of the way. Not that I'm one to judge. Any questions before we go to the meetup? Yes, ma'am. Just yell it out. Sherry Papini. I'm not passing judgment, I'll tell you why. A lot of people think she staged the whole thing, but until I know different, and I mean no, not suspect, but no, I'm on the victim side. 
okay? Because I've been wrong before on the Duke Lacrosse. I believe the victim. I believe the district attorney. Why not? So until I know, I'm on her side. Yep. Y'all don't have a single question. Yes. <laughs> Sherry Papini, the girl that goes missing, and then they find her, and she said some minorities. Yes, the minorities did it again. But a lot of people think she staged her own kidnap. Why? I don't know. But until I know it, I'm going to take her side. Yes. I keep hearing you talk about your book. When is it coming out so I can buy it? I think they said it's coming out in March, and it's going to be, and I'll tell you how it happened. Yeah. I've been missing the courtroom, and I feel a, a, a duty because I've talked to all these crime victims and investigated so many cases that I feel like I need to help people don't be a victim and fight back against America's crime wave. Yes. That's what it's going to be. I can't wait to read it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Just holler it out. What are your thoughts on the Delphi case? On Delphi. Yeah, I know that you, you were on the panel yep, last year. Yep, and we're year. doing it again, a threesome, back-to-back -to -back tomorrow morning, I think starting at 9, and the Delphi families are here. Yeah, you know what? I'm torn between two theories. One, who other than a local or in the surrounding area would have known about that train trellis? Who? On the other hand, if it was a local, then why hasn't anybody been able to identify them? Well, they just released the new sketch, the, the newer sketch, and it's more updated. And that's, I've yes, and when that. I saw that other sketch, it looked just like that. Uh, Younger. Yes, the, uh, the, the mugshot of another offender. But the newly released mugshot to me looks a lot different. But what am I going to believe, a mugshot or the picture? The picture to me, I mean, they got the man's picture. They've got his voice. Exactly. And I wonder if they don't have his DNA, which well, tells me if they do have his DNA, then he has not been caught before, and he's not matching up a genetic profile like, you know, Holes and Golden State Killer. Mm. My children keep wanting to do that, the um, uh, DNA testing. I'm like, y'all, <laughs> if you do that and then you ever do a crime, not that I think you would, they're going to bust you. Okay, just know that deep inside before you do that spit test. So that's what I feel like we have to go on. Can we say God bless that little girl for having the wherewithal to film him? I know. And listening to her gut instincts. And got for her voice. And her family is going to be there tomorrow. And I've got a lot of questions. And they're such nice people. I mean... They took care of the girls. It's not like they were neglecting them and let them run around on their own. It wasn't like that at all. And this was a place where a lot of people went, like a park. And can you imagine? They don't come home, and they don't come home, and they don't come home, and then you realize they're missing. And you're, a, you're a country girl. You know, I grew up in the country as well, and that, it was nothing for us to go and do something. I out know. Woods. I mean, it's safe, you think, and in broad daylight. In the middle of the day. And I know. When I try to tell my children that I would go play out on a pasture where there were cows, they go, mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, Mom. We're not playing with any cows. <laughs> I know. And the crime rate is so low there, yeah. which also is a significant factor in the investigation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like it's inner city Atlanta or New York City. Or here. <laughs> or, yeah, or here. I live here, and it's, it's an everyday thing. You almost become numb to it because you hear it so much, and it's just, it becomes a part of everyday life. But that's another investigative factor of the low crime rate. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to talking to the Delphi families tomorrow. Yes, ma'am? Yes, ma'am? After Mr. Hole's success with uh, the California state killer, mm -hmm. do you see a future for familial DNA? Oh, absolutely. And you know who I've d struck up a friendship with is Karina Vitrano's father, Phil. And, you know, he took on the New York State Assembly to allow, to change the law so they could catch Karina's killer. I absolutely, yes. You know, they... Uh, Innocence Project is all crazy about, they're all mad about familial DNA, and I just love it. Okay, who's got a question? Yes. 
Hi. Um, my question was, have you found out anything new about the missing girl, Carly Gousset? What did she just say? The, the missing girl, Carly Gousset. Is there any update on that? No. Nothing? Wow. But you know what? Now that you said that, I do want to point out that I was wrong when I thought wife and mother was not meant to be for me. Because guess what I have? I wonder if they're in here. David, are you in here with the twins? Oh, could you please show them off? Look what I got. Okay, last time I swear, John, David, and Lucy, stand up. I think the scroll over here is going to go next. And that is their father. I've sadly used all my murder plots in my mystery books, so I guess I can't kill him. Because it's tracking right back to me. I'm so proud of them. Who? Hey. Yes. What do you think about the so-called suicide of Rebecca Zahad? Rebecca Zahad did not commit suicide. I and, know. And can I tell you why? I mean, just act it out. Well, it do all these ropes in a very intricate rope tie. Yeah. And then jump out and then jump Naked. over. Naked. Uh-uh. No, that's not a suicide. Bam. Naked. <laughs> what did she say? Oh, I have so much fun arguing with Dan Abrams. Oh, honey, no. I'm putting all my energy in oxygen and injustice. You know? Maybe I'll have Dan on as a guest one night. Hey, hey, hey look. He's doing fine with his uh, live PD. He's killing it. He's awesome. I just like to torture him whenever possible. Uh-uh. July 13, people. 6 o'clock. I mean, I can't believe it's, it's really come true. We've been working like dogs. Yes, ma'am? Okay, I have a question. Um, I was a public defender for several years, and one of the problems I had... Were you in that courtroom waiting for me to get fingerprinted? <laughs> no, no, no. I think I remember you. <laughs> now that I'm looking at you? Okay. Um, I had a, I, one of my conflicts was that... A defendant one day will be a victim the next and vice versa and as a prosecutor how did you handle that just in when early? defendants become victims and when victims become defendants well this is how I handle it you know lady justice is wearing a blindfold and she doesn't care if the victim is a lady sitting at the pool at the country club or one of my three little boys that were gunned down in a housing project so I I don't have any problem prosecuting a case where the victim has been a defendant, and I've had plenty of them. You can't, I mean, you, you work in inner city Atlanta, you're going to have victims that are defendants. Just, that's it. I don't have any problem with prosecuting a case where a victim has been a defendant. Yes, ma'am. Um, why do you feel that the policemen in the Delphi um, murders are keeping how the, the um the girls died from everyone. Do you think that has anything? I think to help it's them? not the first time that's been done, far from it, that they hold back evidence that only the killer would know. Because when somebody jumps up and confesses, they want to know facts that only the real killer would know. Yeah. It's funny that you say that. I'm from Dalton, Alabama, and they just called two of my friends from high school their killers. And it, the guy had already, one guy said, like, oh, I did it. And then they asked him how they died, and he wasn't even he able know. to tell it. But through DNA, they was able to um, find the guy. You know, it's hard for me to accept false confessions, but they do happen. Yes. Hey, Nancy. Hey. You made it. <laughs> Off Bourbon Street. You walked out and floated back in. That's true. <laughs> what is your reaction to the charging of the resource officer in Parkland with a criminal conduct as a prosecutor. That happened this week. After I saw the picture of him standing there looking at his fingernails while children were being shot, I don't have a problem with it. Do you think it's going to open up a can of worms? I think start? it will open up a can of worms. And I'm, I'm, ha I'm okay with that. Okay. Do I like it? Now, when a cop gets charged with something, it just kills me because I dedicated my whole life to the system. And then that's a kick in the teeth because somebody within the system failed on purpose. 
and it makes us all look so bad. I hate it, but I'm not going to turn away from it. I mean, he made a, maybe didn't do the, even if he didn't do the right thing, just do something. Just get in there and try. Don't hide. So, yeah. Yes. I just wanted to know your thoughts about how Casey Anthony's making her a documentary. You calling it a documentary, little girl? I don't know girl? what to call it. It is Fantasy not a story. documentary. It's a mockumentary. <laughs> and you know what? I am not going to watch it. I'm going to be tempted just so I can talk about it. Yeah. And y'all hear that crime online? Jason, don't jump up and say, we should do the movie. No, we are not doing the movie. I can already tell you're plotting that right now. Nuh-uh. But some, a lot of people will probably watch it. There's a lady right back there. You know that little girl, the um, the pimps that you put away? You, yes. How How's that little girl doing? You know what? I followed her for a long time. I, she didn't know it, but I did. I don't mean physically follow her around. <laughs> but I followed her about what was happening to her. She did graduate from high school, and then I think she moved because I couldn't find her after that. And she was not a crime victim, and she was not in the jail. Those are the three places I looked. And uh, I know she graduated from high school, which was amazing to me. And then after that, I've had people tell me that she moved away from Atlanta, and she should have, because there were too many bad memories for her. Start over fresh. Yeah. Yes. Hello, um, I know you're putting everything into the oxygen thing, but Crime Stories is still going on as a podcast. You know it. Yes. Uh, uh, I'm not I leaving need my Crime daily, Stories. My daily dose. Ew, no, there's just, <laughs> hey, there's never a lack of business, my baby. Okay. There's plenty of business to go around, okay? <laughs> I might, my second part of the question is, I got to meet Jack. I got to meet Jackie, which was phenomenal. That's uh, who I first said every morning on Crime Story. <laughs> and I was just wondering who else will be joining you for the podcasts from the regular crew. Everybody is here. Joe Scott Morgan and his beautiful wife is here. Oh, stand up. Stand up. There's Jason. Jason, stand up for Pete's sake. And there's Jackie. And there's Lee Egan. Where's EK and Wilson and all the others? Are they hiding? Oh, they're upstairs wondering where I am, probably. Oh, no, we're not. Oh, crime, crime story's going strong. Yes. Uh, so first of all, I want to say God bless you for fighting for those people who aren't strong enough uh, to fight for themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my, my question is, have you heard of the Missy Bevers case, and what's your take on it? The what? The Missy Bevers case. Missy Bevers? Yeah. Yes. Have I heard of Yes. You know what? What's your take Jackie, on that? Jackie, go get him. I'm trying to figure it out. He has not been listening to crime stories. I, ha I haven't. I've been working. I mean, that goes all the way back to Asia Lynn. Have I heard of it? Yes, I've heard of it. <laughs> now, um, this is the thing I'm, about I'm that. asking for my wife, so I'm not going to call her out. I don't believe that. It's all you. It, all right, it's me. This is the thing. There's been no movement on that. And I know people kept saying they thought the perp was a woman, but that does not. And I know that the perp did this a lot, mm -hmm. but it, it does not. Joe Scott, wouldn't you agree? That is not a female. If you look at methods and assessment of suicide and homicide, that is completely atypical for a female to commit a crime like that, hand-to-hand -hand mutual combat, beating another woman with a claw foot hammer till she's dead, uh-uh. Dressing up, I mean, look, only, I, this may come back to haunt me, but only a man would play dress up in a SWAT outfit. I mean, uh-uh, no, I don't think that's a woman that did that. And I guarantee you that S-E-X is involved somewhere Anger, cheating, resentment, something like that, because it wasn't a robbery. Nobody stood to, 
benefit financially. It had to be anger over what? That's what I think. Thank you. And if it had just been a bank robbery, um, excuse me, a robbery of a church, which, by the way, I don't think they took anything, the person would leave. And why do you have to dress up like that to commit a robbery at 4 in the morning? Mm -mm. In Midlothian. Mm -mm. She was a target. It was not a robbery turned bad. It was a murder. That's what that was. Yep. Yes. I have a throwback question. Hit me. Okay, so do you believe that Robert Kardashian disposed of evidence for O.J.? <laughs> Come on, girl. <laughs> you know what? Kardashian was a great lawyer. Yes. If he did, I think he did it unwittingly. Okay, maybe he did. Okay. But, you know, there's all that that could be a little borderline conspiracy story because um, Simpson could have gotten rid of the weapons. He didn't need Kardashian to do it for him. But on the other hand, look at the scene. Look at the, his bloody socks. There is so much evidence everywhere. Maybe he didn't have the sense to get rid of it. All I know is he hates me and I hate him. That is not going to change. Yes. Okay. My question's about Tara Grinstead. Yeah. Do they have all the right guys? Yes. Although I think other people may have known about it, because you think those two kept their traps shut all those years? No. But as far as physically doing it, I think they got the right people. I do. Well, what was the point in diffusing all the information from law enforcement for so long, telling us they weren't on the radar, pretending they were looking for other people. Those guys were still in the area all these years. I think they were looking at other people. I think they were looking at ex-boyfriends, boyfriend wannabes, um, okay. t men that she taught with or possibly were her bosses, people within the neighborhood, because that would have made a much more plausible murder suspect. For these two to jump up out of the blue, well, one of them, to jump up out of the blue that she taught years before, right. I, I honestly do not think they had considered them for a very long time until they got direct evidence. I think they were looking at the usual suspects because that's usually the right answer. But wasn't there direct evidence? Wasn't there the glove and the... There was the glove, but when you find a latent finger, a known fingerprint, you got to have something to match it up to. Right. If neither one of them had ever been in the system and got their fingerprints in APHIS, it wouldn't match up to anything. But... I hear what you're saying, and I think a lot of balls were dropped in the initial investigation. And the more people talked about it, the madder it made them. Mm -hmm. And the more they closed ranks within the department. That's what I think. All right. Wow, that's a good question. You know who stuck by me all these years? David, my husband. And when I met him, I was in no shape to be in love at all. And luckily, he stuck by me. I remember many a night, I'd be in the floor. This is one of my best friends from way back when, a defense lawyer, I'm embarrassed to say. And I would, you know those posters I would drag in for closing arguments that I'd have to pay for myself? I would be up in the night writing them. <laughs> and I remember him looking going, oh, dear Lord, in heaven, it's another closing argument. <laughs> and he, you know, he stuck by me through everything, thick and thin, through Dancing with the Stars, through <laughs> all of that. And, um, in fact, I remember when I got asked to go, I said, David, they want me to do Dancing with the Stars. He went, well, why would, you, why, why would you do that? And I said, well, it might be fun. You know what he did? He packed his bags. He got the, we got the children packed, and off we went. And, you know, not many men would do that. 
can't you imagine the stink most of them would raise? <laughs> so I would have to say he stuck by me like a rock from the get-go. And there's been one other person, um, my father, who I recently lost. He and my mom would drive up and watch me try cases. He's the only person, I'm sorry, David, that could change my mind about anything. In fact, when David says something, there's something wrong with me. I just do the opposite. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if he votes one way, I vote the other way. But uh, my dad, Mac, we laughed at the same things. He could dance. We had the best time together. And, you know, even now, even before I came in here, I felt like he was with me. And that was, you know, somebody really loved me till the end. So I would say those two have really been strong for me. Yes? I see you waving at me. I'm not looking. Hit me. Jackie, <laughs> run. Who? Yes. I think police already know, have an idea who did it. And I think they're building the case right now. And it ain't going to be easy. Because the evidence is old. It's not like there's an eyewitness. There's no DNA. And uh, many times, you know who did it, but you can't prove it. I think they know that right now. Yep. Yes. Me? Um, I have a question. Yeah. Do you think the owl did it? <laughs> have you ever heard such a thing? <laughs> She's talking about the Michael Peterson case. And um, oh, the owl? his wife was found at the foot of the stairs. They were home alone that night. And she had a, a pattern of lacerations on her head, dead. Turns out he had a girlfriend back in Germany, and guess what happened to her? She ended up at the foot of the stairs with the same set of lacerations. She was married, and he took custody of her children and brought them to the States to raise them. Uh, the conviction has been reversed. And the defense theory is that an owl swooped down on her and got in her hair and cut her, and that that's what happened. I'm not kidding. I did not make that up. I just, these people ask me, what case would you like to try? I'd love to have tried that case. Yes. You talk a lot about the pain from Keith and his murder, and I'm curious how you healed through that to find and open yourself up to new love. Can I tell you what I, I try to whenever it comes up, which is not often, to crime victims? Don't do what I did. I mourned him. I, tried, I unwittingly tried to sabotage the best thing that ever happened to me over and over and over I could not let myself be happy. I could not let it go. And it was really not until the twins came that I, well, I wanted them to have a happy mother, not a mother who all she cared about was putting bad guys away. And it wasn't until they came that I had happiness. And Keith was murdered in 1979. I had the children in 2007. That's how long I would not be happy. And I wasted a lot of my life mourning and grieving. And I know that's not what he wanted. But now I'm getting blessings rained down on me like I never dreamed of. Can you believe not only a husband that doesn't talk much, I love that about him, and boy-girl twins, I mean, so I've been blessed.
She's looking at me like she's going to get me good. Yes, sir. I do very well when you said your call letters. Jackie, get him. Um, you know what's different? You know, like when I try, would try a case, I would have time to work it. And I could beat the street. I could go meet with the, with the medical examiner. I could meet with the detectives. I could go back to the scene. I could think it through. I loved what I did at HLN. But it was sometimes I'd be driving to work and hear a case on the radio and go, uh oh, let's change the show, let's do that. We've got to do that right now. Get the 800 number. But now I get a chance to work it and to really dig into it and look for the truth. And I love it. Long time no here. Jackie, get him. Okay, last one. Yes. Okay, last two. Go. Hi, Nancy. Um, I'm a cop through and through, as you know, but as I hear you talk about these cold cases and missing uh, children and all these things, I want to know what your opinion is um, when the crime initially happens and the police and detectives arrive. Are, are we messing up a lot? Because that's oh, yeah. kind of what I feel like when I but review But you know these what? Cases. Yes. Yes. But... What do you think is going to happen when everybody rushes to a scene and they're trying to find out what happened, they're trying to take a body away? You cannot keep a crime scene pristine. Things happen. And yes, I hate it when a cop messes up a scene. Do I think they did it on purpose? No. And I don't like calling them out on it because they're there fighting the fight. Nobody else is answering that call at 2 a.m. It's the cops. And I get tired of people attacking the cops. Yes, there's bad cops. But for the most part, they are some of the most decent and honorable people I've ever known. So, there. In the back. Uh, Chris Watts. Oh. Um. <laughs> Three uh. words. Rot <laughs> in hell. <laughs> Um, I was wondering if you'd heard that he was going to appeal. Could he possibly do that, and can he get himself in more trouble if possible? Yes, I've heard he wants a, a do-over. That ain't going to happen. He did not have a trial. When I would take guilty pleas, Renee, I don't know if you remember this, I'd line everybody up and swear them in on the Bible. Everybody would go under oath, plead guilty, I would give a rendition of the facts. They would go, yes, that's what happened. I plead guilty. He's pled guilty. A jury did not wrongly find him guilty. He said, I did it. All right? Now he wants to do over. It's not going to happen. Could it happen? Yes. Do I think it will happen? No. But if he does get a jury trial, in the famous words of Oscar Wilde, be careful what you ask, my dear, for you will surely get it. One more right here. Hit me. She shot a bird at me in open court. I'm not forgetting that anytime soon, okay? And men are in love with her. They write her and send her money. Why, men? What does she have that we don't have? I don't want to hear the answer to that. Okay. Do <laughs> you know that Ron Gransky passed away? That was Lacey's new stepfather. And now Sharon, her mother, alone. I mean, she has the brother, but... Can you even imagine? I will never forget sitting in the courtroom. I was all the way in the back, sitting on top of my backpack so I could see Sharon take the stand. And she took the stand. She had on a yellow outfit. She's beautiful. 
and she she stayed strong until she described Lacey being buried, holding the remains of Connor. And let me tell you, when that jury looked over at Scott Peterson, that was it. That was it. It's over. Okay, quick. What? <laughs> I'm still talking about that. Jody who's in Truett. I was just going to say, Jackie. I would love to do that case again, and now that I've got you in my clutches, have you on to talk about it. There was, yes ma'am. I'm so sick about it. This is the girl that was burned to death. Please don't call him by his first name. Quentin, tell us. He is guilty. Well, yeah, they're going to um, try him next, I think, in here in Louisiana for the murder of, oh, she's so cute, the Asian exchange student. And um, I think they'll get a conviction on it. And then he'll be in jail, and then at some point they'll retry him on Chambers. That's what I think is going to happen. Okay, I, the last thing I need is oxygen to be mad at me before the first show airs. So I'm going, thank you! Hey everyone, I'm Stephanie Gamolka, Oxygen.com correspondent. Thank you 